Well, first, I want to thank very much the organizers of the event, and especially uh, Sheffi and Sesa. Um, and uh, I am going to um, talk something about a new book I've written called, uh, here we go, called Evidence for Hope, Making Human Rights Work in the 20th century, 21st Century, uh, because I, uh, I think it very much relates to the topic of today's workshop. Let me first be clear, speaking here in Budapest, I'm not trying to say to Hungarians that you should be very hopeful about your own situation. I understand that it's a very alarming situation, and I greatly admire the work that's being done by people here. As someone who comes from the United States, uh, under Trump, I'm also not saying that I'm hopeful about the current situation in the US. To tell the truth, of course, I've never, in my relatively long lifetime, I've never been so discouraged about the immediate situation in the United States. So rather, exactly because you in Hungary, in the United States, in Russia, uh, there are these struggles that are going on, and often people feel despair. I think it's important to lay out sometimes a longer term history of human rights change because it using, the, there is a, some, I think, hopeful evidence that comes from that longer term struggle. And having that hopeful evidence from the long term global struggle for human rights may help sustain people uh, like the people in Hungary in the context of a very difficult difficult current situation. And so just to give some, be pretty concrete about this, we actually know that human rights workers suffer from higher levels of depression and post-traumatic stress syndrome. Uh, and we also know from, this is a study that's tried to identify more some of the sources of that depression. And the, the, the feeling that people aren't effective contributes to a sense of depression and uh, post-traumatic stress syndrome. So this is actually not, it, not just a, a, a personal issue, it actually can be a mental health issue. Um, and so uh, I would like to um, very quickly, because I, I, I know I have short time and I have timed it, run through a handful of slides just to make my, to, to give you concrete evidence for that there have been long-term positive changes in the world. Um, and uh, so, for example, there are issues. I'm not saying everything's getting better. There are issues. And refugee and migrant policy is one of them that you're very aware of here, where indeed things are you know, worse today than they have been any time since World War II. But we need to go issue by issue. And when we do that, we find there are many other human rights issues where we see improvements. So this, for example, is a slide about trends in genocide and politicide in the world. Uh, as you know, uh, if people are killed for their political beliefs, it's not legally genocide, so we call it politicide. But this is evidence just about episodes of genocide. So a single genocide comes as an episode. So you'll say, well, what about how many people are affected? So there is a database uh, on something called one-sided violence. One-sided violence is defined as lethal attacks on civilians by governments and formally or, or formally organized non-state groups. Um, and so this is actually the number of people killed, okay, per 100,000 population. So whether we count by episodes of genocide or whether we count by people killed in genocide and mass atrocity in the world, we do see some uh, uh, in trends, improvement trends. Now, you may be saying, yes, but how do we know that it's human rights work or institutions that's contributing to this? And there may be some other issues where the linkage between human rights work and improvements is, is, is more obvious to us, more direct. So if we look at something like the death penalty, for example, um, we find that, uh, we know that groups like Amnesty International, 
been very involved in death penalty work, and in fact, when Amnesty started its death penalty campaign in 1977, as before, before this chart, right, this chart starts in the 80s, only 17 countries in the world had abolished the death penalty in uh, law or in practice. In practice meaning no executions for 10 years. And now we have 140 countries in the world that have abolished in law or practice. And so about almost nearly two-thirds of the countries in the world. So we've moved the situation from 17 countries in 77 to 140 today, which is actually very dramatic social change that we don't always hear about. And we know that that is partly due to the work of, of, of human rights groups and also human rights law. So my colleague Beth Simmons uh, has shown that countries that ratify these protocols of human rights treaties around the death penalty are more likely than to abolish it. Um, but, okay, people will say, what about economic, social, and cultural rights? We're very worried about economic trends. And indeed, there are worsening trends around especially issues like inequality, as we're aware. There also are positive economic trends in the world. So this is the um, Human Development Index. Human Development Index produced by the United Nations. It is a combination of uh, uh, gross domestic product per capita, but also literacy and life expectancy. People said, you know, hey, we don't want just this, you know, GDP per capita. That doesn't tell us anything about real human development. And so they developed something that, that looked also at life expectancy and literacy, which tells us more about quality of life. These are only developing regions. We see that in every developing region of the world, human development has increased. It has increased more in some regions, like in East Asia and Latin America. They're up there at the top. But even in Africa, you'll see uh, there have been improvements in human development. There are issues like famine. This is the orange line. They are declining. Is great famines in the world. It's being charted against the green, which is population. Okay, so every practically every slide I'm showing you, these, these issues of a decline, could be charted against population. And it's good to see in famine because people used to predict as population grew dramatically, as it has in the world, we would expect more famine and more people to die in famine. That's not the case. But what about hunger? You'll say, okay, famine, of course, but hunger. These are two measures of hunger, undernourishment, um, and you'll see there's also a decline in hunger in the world. Now, it's important to say when you, when you say this, that of course we're making progress, but there's a long way to go. We're not meeting our goals, right? But it's important to show that actually we know some things about how to reduce hunger in the world. And so when we're faced with that challenge, it's not like, oh my goodness, no one knows what to do, but rather we have some positive trends that we know the tools we need to use to continue to reduce hunger in the world. Okay, and just uh, for a final slide, this is a, there's a lot of gender improvement in the world. I'm giving you just one here. This is gender inequality measures in education. There's five education measures here, and in all five of them, the level of gender inequality in education has fallen everywhere in the world, okay? And it's very interesting, in the Middle East as well. Some people think, oh yeah, they're not in the Middle East. Just talked to a woman from Saudi Arabia, who, who, who's a physician who told me that even in Saudi medical schools today, you have a, a very substantial representation of women. But this is not that slide, maybe. Oh, oh I'm, so, I'm so sorry. It's hard for me to turn here and see. Okay, whoops. Okay, in the mortality. Pardon me. Um, so, this is a slide that projects to the future. 215 is about two thirds way through the slide. The point being, we know how to bring down the mortality. If we keep doing what we're doing, we're likely by 2050 to end up where this slide says. Okay. Once again, all regions of the world, but differences in regions levels are still unacceptably high. For example, in Africa, where they are coming down. <coughs> okay, so sorry. Tell me sooner. <laughs> <laughs> You're trying. <laughs> okay, there's a gender inequality slide. Five measures of gender inequality, okay, and uh, in the world, 
is a global measure. I could show you, as I said, regional measures and it would show uh, improvements in women's education in all parts of the world. Okay, so, um, and also there's good research on this to show that human rights law matters here. Uh, <coughs> pardon me, research that um, colleagues, political scientists have done shows that actually one of the most effective treaties has been CEDAW, the Women's Convention. Um, and uh, that has contributed to improvements in women's education. Okay, so why are we so, and the, so the puzzle, of course, is why are we so pessimistic about, it? I could, there, there's survey data that shows that most people in the world think the world is getting worse, not better. Okay, I've got another slide I could show on that. There's only two countries of the world in this big survey that think maybe the world is getting better, staying the same, people in China and Indonesia. The numbers of people in Europe and the United States that think the world is getting better range between 4% and 10%, okay? So deep pessimism. So one of the questions is, why are people so pessimistic in light of some of these positive trends? And part of the answer goes back to the question from the woman in the back, and that is the human rights movement actually has some responsibility here. And, but it's a paradoxical responsibility, okay? And that is that the human rights movement has done so much to inform people about human rights violations in the world, and has done so much to make people care more than ever before about human rights, okay? And, and paradoxically, and I think inadvertently, that has led to a perception that things are getting worse, not better. Because we have more and more documentation about violations of more and more human rights all around the world. So we keep raising the bar, new human rights treaties, and we keep writing more and more reports about how we're not complying with those treaties, okay? Uh, and so I think that, and I'm gonna, um, gonna end here, one of the reasons we don't like to talk about progress is because we fear complacency. We fear if we say things are getting better, people are going to say, oh, well, let's stop working, let's go home. Um, but we don't take into account that despair is just as likely to provoke inaction as complacency, right? Um, and uh, to, um, to use a, uh, a term that comes from a community organizer, uh, in Chicago, in the U.S., and in Saul Alinsky. Alinsky said that you need three things to bring about social change. You need anger, hope, and the belief you can make a difference. Anger, he said, is a primordial emotion of justice, but it burns out, okay? It burns people out. And if you don't have hope, uh, and you don't have a belief you can make a difference, you cannot sustain the struggle over the long term. And so I, it's important, I think, we don't want to lose our anger. We don't want to lose our awareness of all the bad things that are happening in the world. But we must complement that anger with hope. Thank you. <laughs>